Well, hello everyone and welcome to the beginning of the last days. I just lost my earpiece right when we <laughs> right when we started. Beautiful. Well done. So smooth, so professional. That's what we are here. Um I uh I always start out the day. Did I say welcome to the last days? Did I actually get that in? Welcome to the beginning of the last days, everyone. My name is Laurel and Tyler Thompson, and I love to start the show by reading from my dad's Bible because I miss him, and uh, it keeps him alive in my heart. And of course, he'll he'll never be gone from my heart. Um, so as you know, he has underlined from stem to stern, and uh, this this word of God. And so today it opened up, and I think it's really apropos because we're going to be talking about God's light in a very dark place. So it opened up to Psalms 18. And it says um, in verse 28, for you will light my candle. The Lord, my God, will enlighten my darkness. For by you, I have run through a troop and by my God, I have leaped over a wall. What does that mean? It says, for you will light my candle. So do you know why we shine? Has anyone ever said, oh, you're just, you're just glowing. Do you know it's because of God? Do you know that everything that we have and everything that we do and everything that's important and any good grace on this planet is because God has given us that grace. And I know some of you are atheists and so you might be saying, well, I don't believe that Laurel and I've been doing pretty good on my own. Well, maintain your strength because sooner or later, the enemy of our soul comes after us and he wants to destroy us. He has a very big plan and he hates all of us and he hates you. And um, if, if you don't believe in him, uh, he maybe, maybe he thinks that's okay for a while, but it doesn't really take away the hatred he has. He's going to find a way to assault you and attack you and to try to destroy your life. But those verses show us that with God, we can run through a troop, leap over a wall. What does that mean? Well, we're, we're, we're miracles. We're walking miracles. We'll be in the fight of our lives and we will get through the troop. We'll be able to get over that wall to victory and everything's going to be okay. And I just love that my dad has underlined verses that help me today to know that I'm going to make it too. Whatever the challenge is in front of me, I'm going to make it through. Now, we're going to talk about a very important subject today. And we have a guest that has uh, really, I'm just so grateful. He's going to tell us a, a real life story. And it's a very harrowing story, actually. And, um, you know, many people these days are not making it through what he had to get through. Uh, We're hearing of a lot of uh, deaths due to drugs and overdose. Um, So let's talk about, well, basically what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Canada is saying it's led to a pandemic of drug use. And a lot of things uh, have increased the use of cannabis, alcohol, tobacco products, much more than usual. I think everyone got stressed out. And with a lot that's gone on, the consumption rates have gone up. But um, deaths caused by alcohol uh, use in Canada, 47,000 Canadian deaths are linked linked to substance abuse each year. There have been 3,790 alcohol induced deaths in Canada in 2020 and 3,860 in 2021. Ontario roadside surveys show that 4.4% of drivers uh, have been drinking um, and the percentage of fatally injured drivers who had been drinking decreased from 34% to two in 2008 to 28% in 2016. Um, I hope that it keeps getting better. But uh, we have seen a lot of issues uh, with opioid deaths. We have seen this on the rise. We know that fentanyl, we believe that it is actually coming in, uh, perhaps a lot of it from from China. And uh, we're on a port here in Vancouver and, you know, over on the East Coast as well. We've got our ports. Canada is surrounded by easy ways that uh, drugs could be making their way into our country, let alone what we've been talking about the last couple of days, and we have an interview coming up actually with somebody showing that, um, you know, 26,000 Chinese um, young, able-bodied men are coming through the southern border. And so this is a very strange thing going on, and we're also finding, and they they are actually finding large, um, you know, um, large 
amounts of fentanyl that they'll discover somewhere. So how much are they missing? I don't know. So this presents all of us with a real problem. Everybody knows somebody who's got um, trouble in someone's family or perhaps faces the ultimate loss, which is uh, the tragic death. We've seen uh, the deaths happening in movie stars' lives as their children um, or they themselves succumb to that. So how do we then address this situation and what is the real answer and what is the hope that we can bring today? Many of you I know are watching and your, um, your testimony will be that a family member or somebody that you know is struggling and as you uh, must be experiencing, it's pain every single day. So I want to just invite Andrew Peloso to the show. Thank you very much for being here. And I I want to tell everybody, Andrew, about our incredible meeting, which was basically over um, the Freedom Convoy 2022, when we were both there covering it, and you subsequently have done a couple of documentaries from that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's good to be with you again, and thanks for having me on your show. Uh, I think the topic we're discussing today, obviously, uh, relates to my personal story and um, yeah, it's a really important issue to actually look at and shine a light on. But yeah, that's the first time I had the pleasure to meet you was um, during the convoy. Um, and we were working on a couple episodes to um, kind of raise awareness as to what was happening in the mandates and the, the policies that were just ultimately not working and growing to be a real frustration for Canadians. And uh, it was great to run into you there. And um uh, and, and, and just to be along for that part of the story. Um, so yeah. thanks for having me. You are so welcome. What an epic piece of history that we lived. It was absolutely yeah. fantastic. And, uh, really? you know, I, I think it's going to be the kind of thing that um, it'll, it'll always be in the news. Uh, and you'll be able to tell your children and grandchildren one day that you were there. And it's, it's huge. I mean, I think it's even going to become more significant as time goes by mm -hmm. because... Um, to me, it was the biggest act of God that I'd ever seen, like where it was shocking, like no one person or anyone could get all those people mobilized or even how my heart yeah. felt compelled after one interview with someone that was going. I just knew I had to go. I knew it. And my husband was so great. Let me go. Uh, my son came along and uh, my assistant, Liz, and we just you know, we had the time of our lives, uh, although sometimes it, it was a little bit scary. Um, so, so James, uh, so, sorry, your, your father is James. And I wanted to say that we just really appreciated um, his, you know, uh, just his inspiration during those times, his strength mm. and his character. His character is a very Well, I hold man. his name. My middle name is James. So you weren't very far off. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Good, good. Well, that's an honor then for you. Um, so can you tell me, though, uh, it was a surprise to me to learn, um, you know, that your journey, because when I met you and everything, uh, just, you know, such a an incredible young man, and I could see that you were very intent on finding the truth and working very hard to get that. And so we were always at all these press conferences, see you on the street and all that. But you have a history and you had to get through um, a very dark time of drug abuse and drug addiction. And so I'm wondering if you can tell me your story about how that came about in your life and walk us through that path because a lot of people watching and uh, people in Canada are in a real crisis right now because of what's coming across our borders, the deaths um, and you know the worry and the pain. So, so tell us a little bit about your background and journey. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um... By the grace of God, um, I live a life of sobriety now, but it was not always that way. Um, drinking and drugs uh, played a huge part of my life. Um, led to moments where I'm a young 20-year-old and I'm fighting for my life um, by my own hand. And um, the disease of addiction is a, a very powerful force. Uh, I remember just growing up, I grew up from an amazing family. I, I, I didn't have much to pin it on. I just knew that I liked drinking and, um, and then later on liked using drugs as well. And they seemed to 
kind of mask or cover up pain that I had felt. And, um, and I was lost. I was very lost and I was, I was broken and I didn't know where to turn. And that's why today, just in my life and, and, um, with those I speak to one-on-one, -on -one, I just try and pass along a message that there is hope for the addict and someone who suffers from this illness. Um, but it's kind of disguised, right? And it's, it's hidden. Um, a lot of people are struggling right now and have struggled for years. Uh, and there's a lot of people that are no longer with us as a result of addiction. And um, I do think a, a, a part of that, at least for my story, that kept me drinking and drugging and using um, was that I didn't know where to turn for help. And I'm really an advocate for recovery. I, I believe that's the only, it's the only solution that really works. Um, you know, we're seeing across Canada, all these safe injection sites and a lot of managing the crisis from a, like a morbidity point of view of just trying not to have people overdose. But um, in my experience, addiction came from a far deeper place that I was trying to nurse my wounds and my struggles and was trying to feel okay. And it was wonderful people who had went before me who had sobered up, um, who showed me a different way. And that way is basically living a life of honesty uh, and transparency and trying to live a life of service and starting to grow okay with not feeling good all the time. And I think that's one of the traps that Mm. addicts uh, I can speak for myself fall into is trying to feel uh, and and uh, feel correctly and fix things all the time and that's really what happened for me so yeah there was lots of lots of drinking lots of drugging um, but yeah, thankfully so I was shown recovery and and really through the power of God yeah yeah okay that's so interesting um, not having to feel good all the time um, you know, it's it's a funny thing that sometimes uh, we we kind of grow up. We're little kids. Uh, if we have a good family, then maybe we feel good. You know, for a, a good part of our childhood. If we don't have a good family, then there's some struggles. Um, then then we might pain might hit uh, sooner. But inevitably, life kicks you in the teeth, doesn't it? I mean, it's kind of yeah. one of the saddest things that it's a really like life is really hard. And then like you can go through a relationship breakup or your friends reject you in high school. Everything could be perfect to high school and then something goes wrong and maybe something in your family dynamic, but inevitably pain comes. So when you yep. say, I think it's so important what you're saying, you had to get comfortable with the fact that maybe you just don't feel good and, and that that's okay. And how do you manage that without um, using drugs? Is that correct or? Yeah, absolutely. Right. We're in a culture of convenience and um, trying to mask things, um, trying to avoid the truths that maybe we don't want to accept. Um, and that was my experience. You know, I could just numb all that out. And by numbing it out, I felt OK for a brief moment until my solution stopped working. Right. Um, the solution of uh, drinking and drugging. Uh, ceased working and you know to be like with your body to be completely uh, inebriated um, but to still have complete chaos in your mind like that was my reality and um, stripped me of a lot of my uh, relationships that I hold dear to today like with my family and good friends and people that actually care about my well-being and um, but it, it does take finding that bottom you know and and that's kind of why you know, when you asked me to come on your show, I was thinking about the culture as it is today and how that's such a stark difference towards uh, recovery based healing, basically, um, for for addiction. And the more we just kind of lower the, the threshold of what we consider life to be, uh, the more we lower our, our, our solutions, the more we are uh, intolerant of God or a view of theism the more we try and mask and disguise things, the, the more people that suffer ultimately, 
and 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 that was my experience in addiction is it took me six years um going to groups and um waiting to find someone waiting to find someone who could walk with me and show me um the truth about myself and um and that was a that, that was a lot to swallow that was a lot to like digest but there's um there's good people and advocates for recovery and i just want to say as well i don't speak like for a, any sort of recovery group this is just this story is my own it's what happened in my life and um all i knew is that my way of living was not working um and i needed help and i don't know where i would be today if i was um surrounded by people that said you know just go visit a safe injection site or um you know it's okay as long as you can manage your use um and thankfully there were some people around me that said you know no you're you're an addict and and you need help and they ga they gave me that help and a lot of it was digesting the truth and learning how to be honest and um digging into things i didn't want to look at that i masked with my addiction so mm. So many things. Uh, I want to start out by saying that, uh, yeah, because um, um, I have so many questions. Um, but I appreciate what you're saying about these safe injection sites. I know one guy, uh, we, we did have somebody on uh, maybe about seven, eight months ago. And basically the word on the street is like they know they're just trying to kill us. Like they're just they're just they're not helping us to get out of addiction. They literally yeah. are trying to kill us and people still dying, you know, from giving, I guess, this, you know, reduction in harm method. And so I appreciate yeah. that that's not helping anyone to get better uh, would be, I think that what you're saying and what I would tend to agree with as well. And also you talk about masking, um, masking the pain. So I want to mm. ask you something about right now. So the pain that you felt you had to mask, is that dealt with in your life at this point? Yeah, absolutely. But it, that's from it, it's a kind of a weird flip of realities it's, it's life is not um life doesn't how am i trying to say this life basically it includes suffering right for all of us no matter who we are um but we make it harder on ourselves or i make it harder on myself whenever i am avoiding actual things that I need to look at. So whether it be emotional pain or all of that, I was not accepting my side of the street. You know, I was not actually taking a hard look at myself and saying, what did I do wrong? You know, what is my part to play in these situations and all of that? And so I would mask that kind of pain uh, through addiction. And that's what kept me out there for years. And it wasn't until I was able to take an honest look at myself of where have I went wrong? These resentments that keep me drinking, where where is my part to play in that and i found there is a big part to play in that and i was almost exclusively responsible so a lot of recovery based um sobriety is really about facing the brutal facts about yourself and trying to develop a a, a new frame of reference of looking at life and that frame of reference is usually about service and focusing on others not yourself that every time i focus on me i have um i have held the pay because we, we were made to love. We were made to experience each other. We were made to, um, to give of ourselves. And alcoholism, addiction, drug addiction, it's inherently selfish, right? It's inherently inward. I'm focused all about my feelings, my desires until it becomes an addiction. And uh, that's really what uh, I, I would say authentic recovery looks at is trying to break down those chains um and it takes a lot of rigorous honesty and uh, it, it takes having people in your in your corner that are going to walk you through it because you can't do it alone yeah would you be able to tell me about how uh you got into drugs like what what was sort of the pitfall that um opened that door and then like how like how dark did it get sort of down that recovery road well, mm. down the addiction yeah. road before recovery. Mm. Absolutely. I, I, um, you know, I'd only experienced, uh, what alcohol did to me and I liked that. And it just took being in the right situation uh, or the wrong situation at the wrong time to, um, 
kind of jump off that or cross that line that I had made for myself. And all of a sudden I'm starting to use drugs. And I liked how those made me feel too. And uh, as with most addicts, you don't know what you're getting into until it's too late. Um, and, and, and not everyone is an addict, right? There's, there's people who can uh, use substances with a far greater level of control than um, an addict can. And, and why uh, is I was that? Just, yeah, I was completely lost. Well, what is that? Is I that a personality know. thing? Think, or? Yeah. yeah. I'm sure it can, includes a little bit of personality, probably some genetics, um, pro probably your body chemistry as well, uh, situations. Who knows? Like, I, I really don't know that question. All I knew is that the effect that substances produced into my life was far greater and more palpable and more effective at that time um, than people that I saw using uh, substances with very, very little wreckage in their life. And yeah, it did. It got to the point, Laura Lynn, where, you know, visiting the hospital by myself completely um, to the point of almost psychosis um, was happening, you know, and it was happening at like 24, 25 years of age. And, and I was too prideful to reach out and ask for help. So I remember walking to the hospital on myself, uh, like, while I'm right in the middle of what is an overdose, and stumbling into there or hailing a taxi by myself and not telling anyone of that, and then trying to hide it best I could and continue working. So it, it, it got dark. <laughs> wow. And <clears throat> wow. On, and, and on times like that, like in the middle of what, what you're calling an overdose. So uh, what happens when you stumble into an emergency? Do they, do they take care of you right away? Like, was it a, a bad situation? Yeah, yeah, they take care of you right away and you say, I think my heart's going to explode or something and they see you right away. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's a good thing. Now, I I, uh, I sobered up before the pandemic, so I really don't know um, where things are at right now, but I, I certainly appreciated having competent nurses, you know, take care of me. Um, and... I, I really don't know where it's at right now. Right. Um, <clears throat> when, <clears throat> sorry, I'm still getting over a real bad cold I had last week. Um, oh, when, um, when you were going through all of this, were you able to hide that from your mom and dad? Um, we, we've talked about this before and I thought I was doing a great job. Apparently I wasn't, they, they knew what was going on. And that's, it's kind of the mystery with addiction is that, you think you're being cunning and hiding this from people that love you, but you're not, you're not right. You're, you, you look dead, right? If, if, if someone was to look at my eyes, you know, five, six years ago, they would see like almost a, it's like a great sleep had washed over me, you know? And, um, I, I don't, I don't think I did a very good job hiding, but I attempted to try my best to. And the, the unfortunate reality there is, isolation is a big part of addiction. It's actually one reason why when the pandemic was happening and I was seeing these mandates that were like so isolating on the human person, it, it kind of like got me thinking like, this is not good. I've lived this before. I actually right. think, and I attribute that to God's blessing that he allowed me to experience this personal um, battle with addiction um, before the pandemic to adequately prepare myself for looking clearly at, at what's happening in our culture and in the world. And I'm really thankful for that. But yeah, addiction has a real isolating element to it. And you'll see people who are suffering with addiction basically repel or get very superficial with anyone who is trying to help them, uh, which is why for the family and parents of people who are suffering with addiction, uh, it's my personal opinion that that kind of tough, hard love is really the only approach um, or else you continue enabling behavior that could could jeopardize their life, you know, so. So, so you mean, because um, you're going to be speaking to a lot of parents right now and people that are just really, you know, at their wits end uh, trying to help somebody. Um, when you say tough love, what does that look like? What works and what doesn't work? Yeah, for me, it meant... Uh, 
you know, my parents basically saying you're not welcome at home anymore until you sort yourself out. And um, saying obviously that they were there for me, um, should I ever need tangible help, but um, they were did not coddle me. And I really thank my parents that they didn't, it allowed me to get to my rock bottom quicker. And that's what I would say the parents who are listening is um, if you have someone dear to you in your life that is struggling with addiction, um, by nursing their wounds or um, basically listening to whatever line they're giving you of why it's so hard and, and this kind of anything that encourages an addict's victimization, I would generally say is not good for them um, because you're basically you're robbing them of that opportunity to have a gift of desperation, a sufficient gift of desperation to do the work required to receive some healing and actually live recovered, not just live sober for several days, weeks, or months um, in, until their next relapse. That's what right. I would say. So tell me of that a sufficient level of misery, I guess, uh, yeah. is, is yeah. kind of needed. And you talk about this bottom. So um, two questions. Uh, did you come to a, a one-time bottom or several bottoms? Um, if you could tell us about that, what that was like, um, what it was like to to finally go, I, I guess you have to make the decision. I really hate this. Like this isn't this is not fun. This is not. Yeah. You know, tell me about what that's like. And also, are you open about your? Because I, you don't have to tell us about your drugs of choice, but um, just maybe it's helpful to somebody. I don't know. Yeah. No, as far as categorizing what drugs I took, it's more, what did I not take? You know, mm. it's, uh, um, it was basically anything, anything to feel elated and feel sufficiently high to, to numb out my problems. Um, they were certainly hard drugs, that's for sure. So yeah, what I would say to, um, to that question is I had several bottoms, right? I always thought my new bottom was my last bottom. Every time I tried to sober up, I, with all the will I could um, grab hold of, I said, this is it. I'm done. I need to sober up. I don't want to die. Um, I was authentic and I meant it every single time I tried to sober up. Um, but my last bottom, it was the great gift. You know, I didn't, I didn't die. Thanks be to God. And something clipped like something clicked in my heart of, I need, I, I need help. I can't do this alone. And then that's where the first step to real sobriety and recovery is accepting that I actually am an addict, you know, and that takes a long time for a lot of people. Um, it took me a good five or six years, which I've now realized is actually a short period of time um, compared to some of those who really suffer out there. Right. So that last bottom, um, could you describe what was going yeah. on for you and, and, uh, what, what that was like? For sure. Drinking, using a lot of drugs, um, trying to hide it from all my friends and family. Um, I had gotten to the point of addiction where I was really isolating. I wasn't going out anymore. It wasn't, wasn't fun anymore. You know, I was, I was using essentially to cope. And, um, I, I had to, uh, hail a taxi to the hospital to get checked out because I was fearful that I wasn't gonna, um, I, I was not going to be around anymore. Um, I just had that feeling there's that intuition, mm -hmm. um, close to near death experiences where you just know that you're playing with fire and it's a different kind of fire than you're used to. So I went to the hospital completely humiliated and ashamed. Right. And, um, attempted to sleep it off, got some IVs, all this kind of stuff. And, uh, once I had my faculties again, um, you know, it was several, several, a few weeks later, um, I basically felt like I, I, I don't have the sufficient willpower to keep this out under control. So I called a very uh, dear friend and mentor and I called him in tears and I said, I can't do this alone. Um, I need help. I don't know what I'm talking about. I do not know how to stay sober and I will do whatever it takes to um, save my life. And it started off very much like that. And it, as with most addicts, like we talk about spirituality or faith or Jesus, like we talk about God and 
addicts don't want anything to do with that. They don't want to hear it, right? And that honestly is a defense mechanism of shame. Uh, that was my experience, at least. I was so ashamed of who I was. You know, a, um, a young, healthy man from a good family who had dreams and ambitions like all of us. And I had turned my life into an absolute charade and a joke. And I had no one else to blame but myself. And once I could swallow that pill of honesty and actually acknowledge that I needed help and I was not okay, and I couldn't tell another lie again, and I was broken, that's where the help came. And the help was there all along because there are good people in our communities, especially in the recovery world, that really want to take um, guys and girls, young and old, all ages, um, and want to actually take them through this path of recovery. But uh, most that need this solution are not sufficiently humbled um, and they're not ready. They're not ready to receive the solution. And I got news for anyone who uh, is um, struggling from addiction like I did. If you got what I had, there's one more stop on the block and, and that is a relationship with God. And that's what it takes because there is, there's a lot of people that tried to use their own willpower and tried to do it without surrendering to God. And um, uh, it's been my experience with friends and people close to me that it, it hasn't worked. In fact, my, my first sponsor, um, God rest his soul, uh, went back out again. He, he, didn't, uh, he didn't get it and he wasn't one of the lucky ones. And I remember my first 11 months of recovery um, hearing that he had passed away and relapsed. And I, I really attribute that to, um, well, actually, I don't understand. I don't know why God takes some of us and lets some of us stick around longer. But all I know is that a relationship with God is what saved my life and is why I'm sober and relatively happy today. So, so, um, so you had to kind of get to that place where you felt that you couldn't do it. You had to admit, I just can't do this um, on my own. And th this fellow came along and really helped you with that. And so did at that point, is that when you began kind of rectifying things with your family? And did, did you have conversations telling them, um, you know, I'm at the end or uh, must have been a, a difficult process? Right. Yeah, no, that actually didn't happen first. Um, you know, where, uh, how he this man taught me was um, to basically look at first acceptance that I'm an addict and then really showing me the despair of my condition and that basically all hope is lost provided um, if I don't take certain steps. And um, I endeavored doing this work. It's an inside job, you know, of actually being honest with yourself in the companionship of someone who's went before you and is sober today. And I started working through this and um, went through this program with him. And it wasn't until um, I would say about six or seven months and I gave it everything I got. Like that was essentially my full time job. Um, it, it wasn't until that juncture that I really started having the ability to kind of poke my head out and try and reunite with with family. And there's a there's a huge toll that addiction uh puts on families and um, there's amends that need to be made. And that is not a quick process because if I were to go, you know, if I were to go to you, Laura Lynn, and you knew me in my, in my, uh, my drinking days, and I were to, you know, a, a week after you seeing me out of my mind, come knock on your door and say, Hey, I'm sorry. And I'm better now, by the way, it wouldn't mean anything to you. Right. But if I had shown consistently through my actions that I was ready to take the step of living a new life, and that was done with a couple months or years under my belt, um, it, it would be a whole different tone and probably a whole different response uh, coming from you or, or anyone who experiences addiction in their life. You know? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, tell me about the what you saw in yourself, like the character changes. Um, you had to kind of admit, I guess, that that you're capable of great deception and that yeah. that's not what you wanted to be part of your life. 
that, that that's a perfect word uh, that I would use is I was deceptive, right? Because I was trying to protect myself from anyone who is going to get in the way of my drugs, my drinking or my high. And um, the nice thing about a rock bottom is you're sufficiently humbled. If it's if you really have a rock bottom, you 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 start realizing that you can't do this on your own anymore. And, and that's where that acceptance comes in. And that's where um, someone who's suffering with addiction can actually start reaching out for help and basically developing a whole a whole new life, not of their own power, but of God's power of like actually looking at these things and trying to develop character and um, trying to uh, be honest. Honesty is a big one because usually the deception involved in addiction um, necessitates that if you are going to be sober, and you're going to stay that way, that you have to be a pretty like straight and narrow, honest individual um, because your ego likes to uh, protect itself from what it does not know. Yeah. And also um, this humbling process, that's a beautiful uh, thing for any human being to come to. And, and we yeah. all do, like I'm thinking, I've never had a drug addiction, but I've had different other kinds of uh, personal foibles that brought me to that humility and that broke me as well. And I am so grateful for that. That is a um, that is a wonderful place that through pain and usually personal uh, mistakes brings us uh, to some place that actually sets us up for a great life from then on. And yeah. It's a it's a great gift that God allows really those that he's going to greatly use. So you didn't give God much of a place, I guess. Um, you knew of God, right? Your family was uh, Christian and all of that. But mm -hmm. you yeah, did. Yeah, and quite devout. And mm -hmm. but I, I, I was um, attempting. This was not always like it's, you know, it's a huge huge story as everyone's story is but um there were a lot of attempts to uh, understand god let's call it but I, I i more relate that to putting god inside a box you know um and I, I basically tried to create a god that i had the terms of, of who god was going to be instead of that um you know i believe humility is the pathway to to uh seeing god is to having a relationship with god now i believe that um but i think there was a great amount of pride and protection that i was um putting up in the way of my faith and so it took me getting honest with myself because like okay like those those um uh, those prayers when you're really in a pinch and you're on your knees and you're like god if you're out there save me I need help now. Did you get, did you actually <laughs> pray that? Did you have to actually oh, say that? So many times, so <laughs> many times, Laura yeah. Lynn. So, and, and God answers prayers, right? But God mm. sees the heart, right? And, and I think it's really important to, um, to pray and spend time with God with uh, the best we can with a level of authenticity, not saying the right words um, to, uh, win favor with people's whose opinions we respect, but to speak the language of the heart, right? Mm -hmm. And and when we speak with the language of the heart, we we free ourselves, we we open a new door. And and, and that was kind of the new door and the new opportunity I was given um, to live a life of sobriety and not this kind of white knuckling sobriety where you're just trying not to drink or use. But it was like as if something was broken in me and until I was until I was able to be honest with myself and with God and with those around me um, that cared about me. It was until that happened that all of a sudden it's like a, it's an opportunity at a new life. And I just want to say this to anyone who's listening who either struggles with an addiction of some sort um, or, or family members or, you know, just anyone who's going through a rough go with addiction right now, have hope. You know, I think it's so important to have hope, especially in dark times, because change actually is possible. I firmly believe that change is possible. 
provided that each one of us are willing to sufficiently open our hearts to a new way and acknowledge that we don't have the answers. And uh, that's basically the golden uh, key Mm -hmm. or the golden ticket for, for recovery in my experience, at least. And, and that's that you don't have the answer yourself. You can't just will it with all your might, letting go of that idea. Right. A a sobriety based on willpower, your own willpower and intellect is a, uh, I I consider that settling for crumbs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you yielded all of this then, and you got good help from a, a great mentor, which is important. Um, and you were, were starting to walk in authenticity, brokenness, and all of that. Did that take away all the cravings, or were you still dealing with that physical desire? Mm. So it's an interesting thing. The the I guess what I've learned, this is not mine, but I, I've learned that cravings really only happen um, when a substance is actually in your body. Um, and, and the time it takes for it to leave your body. Um, I don't experience cravings anymore, nor did I in my early months of recovery from substances. Um, what I did experience was a mental obsession. And that mental obsession was um, this feeling like I don't feel right and I got to get right quick. And that mental obsession I really believe it was in me because there was a a, a spiritual sickness that I just didn't quite measure up and I didn't feel whole. And it wasn't until I looked at the spiritual components of how do I live my life? How do I treat people? You know, what do I actually believe is true? What, what is the purpose for my life? Wasn't until I started looking at those questions that my spirit was made whole. And as a result of my spirit being made more whole, my, mind became healthier and these obsessions ceased to be as um cumbersome to me because there's um with mental obsessions um you basically build this pathway in your mind and it says like okay andrew if you're feeling bad alcohol fixes that and it's just this neural pathway that just keeps going and i was strengthening it for years and it, 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 it's not something that just falls away quickly. So did I have obsessions about wanting to relapse? Absolutely. Um, do I have those anymore? By the grace of God, no, I don't. That's amazing, I think, because uh, part of what we're seeing happening is that um, it's important what you said about hope, that, that you have hope that you can get past yeah. it. And that will yeah. maybe help you. It's also important that you said it's because the substance is in your body. And so that's sort of a brief, that's a time you have to bear down, get help, you know, do what you can and make sure that that substance is out of your body. Um, But, but people sometimes relapse. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, sorry for cutting you off. That's why Mm -hmm. when I was talking about these, uh, supervised consumption sites or these kind of measures that we are adapting as policy and have been for some time, it robs the sufferer from releasing them of that craving from no no longer experiencing that craving and starting to get to true recovery, which is, uh, you know, it's a mind, um, work and it's a heart work, you know? And, and, and so if we leave all these people who are suffering and alone, and fearing for their life to just controlling their substance use, I, I, I believe we play a part in robbing them of the actual solution. You know. Mm. And so your testimony today is that you are not struggling with these cravings, you are free. And how has God then and that relationship taken you to a, a new life. Tell me about life today. And I know you have a, something very exciting in February. You're getting married. Um, <laughs> so, so obviously very good things have happened after, uh, almost dying, almost overdosing, uh, just being yeah. in despair, a very good life has happened. Yeah. And praise God. Um, that's a big question. I, I'd say today, 
right? I, I'm just one man. And um, I, I only know a little. <laughs> but what I do know is um, trying to build a deeper relationship with God the best I can, trying to focus on other people, um, trying to, as Jordan Peterson says, to we all have pain in this life, but trying to turn that pain into purpose. And if that purpose is based in altruism and giving of oneself to help other people, uh, it can be a beautiful life. And I endeavor to do that. And, you know, I fall all the time, but thankfully I don't have to fall into relapses. Um, that has been lifted and I'm not special. I didn't do something special. All I did was humble myself and my pride, realize that my situation was dire and ask for help. And um, that's kind of my my mission now is if people are struggling or need help is ask for help and humble your pride. You're going to get through that. And yeah, today it's a, it's a beautiful life. You know, I, um, I, an addict that was just trying to stay sober for eight hours is, is, you know, I'm now getting married and I have a healthy relationship. Um, and I love her and she loves me. And, um, I get to have an amazing family life now where I'm connected with my family and extended family. And I'm a present guy that actually shows up now, um, for my family and, um, great relationships with my brothers and my sisters and, uh, life has just taken on a whole new meaning, meaning, and it's kind of, uh, as a result of me stepping out of the way and, um, trying to, um, build an authentic relationship with God. And, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's God that keeps me sober. And I know there's a lot of people that find, uh, certain solutions for recovery and, and I'm truly happy for them. I'm not, I'm not here to, on your show to say that there's only one way, you know, every, every story is complex and different, but, um, addiction is inherently a self absorbed illness. It's a disease of selfishness. So I've, um, I've heard from smarter people than me that self can't heal self. And um, I need to be looking outward if I'm actually going to uh, keep hold of this solution. And so it's a good life now. I get to make films and I get to be sober and I get to remember what I did the night before. And it's it's great. So, yeah. yeah. And I like the way you use that word present. Like uh, when you're in uh, some sort of substance and all that, like you're just not there, like you're, you're in an altered state and you're robbing yourself really of that beauty right. of enjoying a moment because it's so incredible to be with family and a fiance and Christmas. Like imagine like all of this is so beautiful and would be so robbed from you to still be yeah. in that place. Um, I want to ask you one more thing before I let, let you go. And that's about forgiving yourself. Like, was that a process? Did you have to, was it hard after mistakes made, hurting your family, um, your, you know, like things that had happened and, and how mm -hmm. did you ultimately forgive yourself if you did? Yeah. I don't know where I've heard this, but it stuck with me for years and I believe it to be true. Um, there's a wise guy who was talking about, you know, the process of making amends with others and yourself as well. And he was saying in this story, um, you know what, if you seek to clear away the, the damage that you've done to others and you honestly live in principle and character and you try and serve other people, maybe you'll just wake up one day and found that you've forgiven yourself because you're a man who is totally different than the man you knew. And I believe that to be true. I have found the process of recovery and learning from mentors of mine and trying to do the next right thing, no matter how many times I fall, has produced who I am today. And the man I am today uh, is absolutely um, a man who's forgiven himself. That's, that's yeah. what I would say. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Um, I'm so encouraged by your story and I hope that it's encouraging others. Um, here and there, I hear from people um, very, very broken by Canada's um, problem with addiction, opioids, 
uh, what's coming in, fentanyl, deaths. Um, this is breaking family after family after family. And your story uh, was is going to bring hope to someone's heart. And so I pray that uh, your legacy will be that of bringing healing now to, to many people's lives. And even through the incredible documentaries that you're doing, and I don't know if you'd ever think to do one on uh, this subject, but it might be great mm -hmm. because this is breaking us. Uh, this is breaking Canada. Um, we want to just put up your graphic one more time then under your name, because tell people how they can see the videos that you've created. Sure. Uh, yeah, that um, if you follow that website there, there's um, some links to some films uh, me and my team have been working on. And uh, the first one, which I'd love to announce that was uh, uh, released, I think about four or five months ago, is When the Mob Came. And this has been a labor of love and a project which I co-directed um, for the last four years. And it really dives into uh, the crisis that we face as a culture with uh, cancel culture and just like a lot of um, the deeper factors that are from our society that we've kind of all embraced um, that lead to crippling our democracy. And um, the story of this um, amazing woman, her name is Kaylin, uh, is just incredible. And I got to follow her journey uh, as she faced cancellation, unjust cancellation uh, for the last four years. And I'd encourage you to, to click the link and, and check it out. And Laura Lynn, thank you so much for having me on your show. You're so welcome. Thank you for being willing to be vulnerable and tell us all, all of this. It's such a good story. Um, make a movie about it. Um, Andrew, make a movie about your life and uh, coming through. Maybe that'll be a project for a later time when we're not facing the uh, apocalypse. But anyways, <laughs> <laughs> it feels like it, right? Yeah. Oh, well, and so... thank you for your work and just shining a, a light into dark yeah. places. And I think that's really important, the work that you do. And uh, I just hope that whoever listened to this interview, that... Um, they are encouraged to take the pain of their life and instead of turning it into victimization, to turn that pain into purpose and, and altruistic yeah. purpose to, to help serve others. And you can do it. <laughs> mm, thank you so much. Andrew, you're amazing. I look forward to talking to you again and uh, seeing what you're up to because now you've become a real world changer and I love it. Say hi to your dad for me. I will. Thanks, okay. Laura Lynn. God bless. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful. <clears throat> I love it. So while the world's falling apart and, uh, you know, we're hearing a lot of bad stories regarding this, there is positive stories. And I know that uh, when, I, you know, back in the day, I would interview teen challenge people. And that's kind of why I did this. Like, this is like mm, 15 years ago, we'd have people on from teen challenge and they would just have some incredible stories of recovery and the beauty uh, of coming through it. So when I'm, you know, watching in the news that we're seeing like such heartache right now, I wanted to rem uh, bring a reminder because, um, you know, Andrew, you know, we saw him uh, during the, the Freedom Convoy and knowing his dad, what an amazing family he has. Um, wanted to just bring that reminder of hope to you today that it can truly be better. Well, we've got some crazy stuff going on in the world. Have you seen the anti-Semitism that's rising up? It's certainly rising in Canada. I heard today in Calgary that the mayor is not going to, JT, did you hear this? The mayor is not gonna go and celebrate, um, is it the, the lighting the menorah or something like that? And you know, that's nuts. But look in the States first, let's look at what's going on there. So recently, I think this is a member of, co of Congress, right? Mm -hmm asking these presidents of these large universities, how does this all happen? How does she get them all there? Do you know? Like subpoenaed? And imagine you're subpoenaed to speak in front of Congress. So she subpoenas all these president, presidential heads of these. Now, ironically, they're all women and uh, probably fit categories because they are horrendous and they've had to back you know, backpedal on all of their answers. So take a look at this incredible line of questioning. And I'm sure many of you have seen it, but isn't it stunning? Take a look. 
Okay, a Harvard student calling for the mass murder of African Americans is not protected free speech at Harvard, correct? Our commitment to it's free speech. It's a yes speech. or no question. Is that corrected? Is that okay for students to call for the mass murder of African Americans at Harvard? Is that protected free speech? Our commitment to free speech. It's a yes extends. or no question. Let me ask you this. You are president of Harvard, so I assume you're familiar with the term intifada, correct? I've heard that term, yes. And you understand that the use of the term intifada in the context of the Israeli-Arab conflict is indeed a call for violent armed resistance against the state of Israel, including violence against civilians and the genocide of Jews. Are you aware of that? That type of hateful speech is personally abhorrent to me. And there have been multiple marches at Harvard with students chanting, quote, there is only one solution, intifada revolution, and quote, globalize the intifada. Is that correct? I've heard that thoughtless, reckless, and hateful language on our campus, yes. So based upon your testimony, you understand that this call for intifada is to commit genocide against the Jewish people in Israel and globally, correct? I will say again, that type of hateful speech is personally abhorrent to me. Do you believe that type of hateful speech is contrary to Harvard's code of conduct, or is it allowed at Harvard? It is at odds with the values of Harvard. Can you but not say here that it is also... against the code of conduct at Harvard? We embrace a commitment to free expression, even of views that are objectionable, offensive, hateful. It's when that speech crosses into conduct that violates our policies against bullying, harassment, Does that speech and not cross that barrier? Does that speech not call for the genocide of Jews and the elimination of Israel? When you that testify that you understand that is the def definition of intifada. Is that speech, speech according to the code of conduct or not? We embrace a commitment to free expression and give a wide berth to free expression, even of views that are objectionable. You and I both know that's offensive. not the case. You are aware that Harvard ranked dead last when it came to free speech. Are you not aware of that report? As I observed earlier, I reject that characterization. It's the of data our shows it's true. And isn't it true that Harvard previously rescinded multiple offers of admissions for applicants and accepted freshmen for sharing offensive memes, uh, racist statements, sometimes as young as 16 years old? Did Harvard not rescind those offers of admission? That long predates my time as president. But you so understand that Harvard made that decision to rescind those offers of admission. I have no reason to contradict the facts as you present them. Correct, here. because it's a fact. You're also aware that a Winthrop House faculty dean was let go over, he, over who he chose to legally represent, correct? That was while you were dean. That is an incorrect characterization of what transpired. What's the characterization? I'm not going to get into details about a personnel matter. Well, let me ask you this. Will admissions offers be rescinded or any disciplinary action be taken against students or applicants who say, from the river to the sea or intifada, advocating for the murder of Jews? As I've said, that type of hateful, reckless, offensive speech is personally abhorrent to me. I'm today that when no action will be taken. What action will be taken? When speech crosses into conduct, that violates our policies, including policies against bullying, harassment, or intimidation, we take action. And we have robust disciplinary processes that allow us to hold individuals accountable. What action has been taken against students who are harassing and calling for the genocide of Jews on Harvard's campus? I can assure you we have robust What actions have been taken? I'm not asking. Actions underway. I, I'm asking what actions have been taken against given, those students. Given students' rights to privacy and our obligations under FERPA, I will not say more about any specific cases other than to reiterate that processes are ongoing. Do you know what the number one hate crime in America is? I know that over the last couple of months, there has been an alarming rise of anti-Semitism, which I understand 
is the critical topic that we are here to discuss. That's correct. It is anti-Jewish hate crimes. And Harvard ranks the lowest when it comes to protecting Jewish students. This is why I've called for your resignation. And your testimony today, not being able to answer with moral clarity, speaks volumes. I yield back. Wow, right? So there's another one where she's not only um, this lady, but she's, she's asking the question of the other presidents of the universities and they have equally bad um, answers and they all sound like they have the same script you know under the context like what context is it okay imagine for instance as we've i've been in, involved in rallies and supporting um you know our views that uh, you know, certain views on gender. This is how we feel about that. Now I'm going to be careful because the platforms I'm on. <laughs> but imagine if at any point when you're against another uh, ideology, when you're against another way of thinking, that you would call for that people group's annihilation or speak about them in these manners. How is this okay? How is this okay? I want to go to another issue that is absolutely staggering, and this is on the southern border of Arizona. And Bill Mulligan, Mulligan, uh, of Fox News, great name. Uh, he's down there, boots on the ground, looking at something. Now, you may have heard Kamala Harris and and Biden talk about how the border's closed down there. Like, there's a crisis beyond crisis happening. And it's going to affect Canada because people get in up here as well. Take a look at what's really happening at the border. Zana, good morning to you. Here in Lukeville, we are quite literally in the middle of nowhere. Two and a half hours to the closest major city. Thousands are crossing here illegally every day, and the situation is completely unsustainable. We'll step out, give you a look at the scene here. This is a mass of hundreds upon hundreds of people who have crossed the border illegally and are camped out here at the border wall, waiting to be apprehended by Border Patrol. You'll quickly notice these are all single adult Man, there is not a single woman or child in this group you're looking at. And these guys are coming in from all over the world. Large amounts of African men from Senegal, from Guinea, from Mauritania, from Egypt, others from the Middle East, others from Asia. This is Border Patrol's Tucson, Arizona sector, which just had 17,500 illegal crossings last week alone. That is the highest weekly total ever recorded. We talked to one for this sector. We talked to one man from Mauritania who told us uh, he paid smugglers $10,000 to get here, first flying into Colombia. We talked to another man from Guinea who says once he's processed, he plans to head to New York City. Now, you might be wondering, how does this happen when we have the border wall right here? Well, there are breaches is all in the wall and we want to show you this remarkable video we shot yesterday. Take a look at this. Border Patrol and federal contractors were trying to fix a hole in the wall that smugglers cut when a huge surge of illegal immigrants came pushing through that gap trying to get into the United States and successfully doing it before Border Patrol could fix it. They were trying to weld it and all these people started pushing through the hole in the wall. And you'll notice there's a human smuggler dressed in black right on the other side of the wall. He sees our camera. He kind of just gives us a shrug and then salutes us, uh, essentially saying, hey, there's nothing they can do about it. Border Patrol has been finding these cuts in the wall all over the place. They try to fix them. There's nothing they can do about it. They say it's like a game of whack-a-mole. Take a listen to what the Border Patrol Union had to say out here. This is what has caused, has been caused by an open invitation by the administration that said, hey, come one, come all, ask for asylum and you'll get released. It takes a toll on operations. It takes a toll on the men and women that are out there putting their lives on the line each and every day. Elsewhere along the border, take a look at this video out of Border Patrol San Diego sector. News Nation capturing this footage of a large amount 
of Chinese male nationals that crossed illegally near the Hakumba Hot Springs area. So this is happening all along our southern border, guys. The entire world is showing up here at our doorstep. They're crossing illegally, and they are expecting to get released here into the United States. It's happening here in Lukeville. It's happening in Eagle Pass. It's happening in San Diego. Dana, you mentioned off the top, the port of entry here in Lukeville is completely closed down. That is because CBP is surging officers here to try, help, try to help Border Patrol deal with apprehending all these folks. On top of that, all of the Border Patrol checkpoints in the Tucson sector and the local highways have also been closed down. Those checkpoints are invaluable for trying to be a second line of defense in stopping both human smugglers and fentanyl smugglers. So it's all hands on deck out here, guys, mm -hmm. and you can see the situation mm -hmm. completely unsustainable. About 2,000 to 3,000 crossing right here every single day. Okay, let's play that Laura Ingram video. Actually, we're, we're kind of saving this one for another interview, but do you have that one, JT? So I'm watching the news, you, the one that I did off of, uh, yeah. So I'm watching the news the other night, and sometimes what I do is I don't know if I'll ever see the information again, so I back the television up, and then I, I film it. So it's terrible audio, and I'm sorry, and it's, you know, it's off my phone, but I did my best to keep very, um, uh, you know, still, You've got to see what's going on as well. Look at this other angle. Why are so many Chinese nationals crossing our southern border? What are their intentions and why is no one talking about this? Check this out. In fiscal year 2023, more than 24,000 Chinese nationals were arrested by Border Patrol. That's more than the years of five years previous combined. Wow. Now, the New York Times says that many of these Chinese nationals fly into Ecuador, then pay smugglers to guide them through the dangerous jungle between Colombia and Panama en route to the United States. Well, does the group in this video look like they just trek for weeks through the jungle? How do they all get those rolling suitcases through? And who's really facilitating their trips? There's something going on here, and the Biden administration does not seem the slightest bit concerned. Joining me now, Gordon Chang, senior fellow of the Gatestown Institute, author of the new book, China is Going to War. Gordon, so you think Biden and Xi up in San Francisco discussed this issue of all these Chinese coming into the United States? Actually, I don't think so, um, because this is something that Biden can't deal with. He's allowing thousands, maybe tens of thousands, of saboteurs into the United States. Remember, Laura, on 9-11, it took only 19 terrorists to kill 2,977 Americans on one day. We've got so many more coming into the U.S. from the southern border. And it's not just the Chinese. We've got Syrians and we've got Venezuelans who are very suspicious backgrounds coming in. And the Biden administration is just releasing them into the U.S., not tracking them at all. Well, this is why Hunter Biden making all that money in China is is a problem for many reasons. But you, you kind of wonder whether people look the other way when this is obviously is something going on here. In fiscal year 2023, 21,000 of those 24,000 Chinese nationals who crossed were single adults. Gordon, yeah. what does that tell you? Well, it, it tells me that these are saboteurs because they are coming in in packs of 5 to 15 of military age, traveling without family members and pretending not to speak English. And U.S. Border Patrol knows that some of them have links to the Chinese military. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, so I think that this is a very um, interesting problem that we have with um, a lot of these young, uh, able-bodied men from all over the world and including China. Like, why would any Chinese be basically getting tickets down to Ecuador and then, you know, making their, their way up to get into the United States of America? There's a lot of ways in for Chinese. You could be a student, um, all kinds of ways. And these guys are just coming up to get basically residency in the United States of America. What does it all mean? And also Canadians reporting similar things in different parts where we have these, um, you know, people coming over Roxham Road 
Uh, we've got uh, different ways that people can fly in from different countries, you know, and can quite easily get in. And then perhaps, you know, we don't have a way of tracking them to see when they leave or how they leave and maybe they hide. So something very odd does seem to be going on. And right now, um, I think it's important that we hope that as the end of Justin Trudeau's reign comes, and we do pray that it ends, join with me in a quick prayer that Justin Trudeau would be removed sooner than later in a stunning uh, moment of m miraculous intervention that Trudeau would be removed. I'm praying for that day because he's done such damage. And we pray that even as in biblical times, they would pray for a righteous leader. We pray for that righteous leader to come to Canada. Um, in the meantime, we're going to get Pierre Polyev. <laughs> um, I, I, sometimes I see Pierre really trying that he's moving towards what's important. And I'm, I give him a lot of grace for that. And I appreciate it. I really do. There's still some things very concerning with uh, Pierre Polyev's position on certain things. So uh, he's probably going to be in, and we pray for this to be um, a good move for Canada. But we do have these issues, and I hope that he has the courage, because it will take courage. It will take absolute courage to be able to deal with this. The other thing that is going to be important to have courage for is for things like uh, what's going on with this New Zealand um, gentleman that, and you can just put the video up there on the side, but um, basically, um, you know, we have a gentleman that released some, some information to the public, and we do wonder, I'm not going to say too much because um, we do hope that, that provinces like um, Alberta under Danielle Smith will be releasing good information on the kind of thing that has been released in New Zealand. And I'm not certain why governments are so hesitant to release the truth to people. <clears throat> the only reason that someone would not want the truth for the protection of good people and citizens, that they wouldn't want information released, potentially means they're compromised in some way. Perhaps they took uh, bribes, perhaps they took, um, you know, little kickbacks, and now they're stuck. Maybe they're being blackmailed. I don't know, but this is the problem. So we do hope that uh, the release of, um, of data regarding the events of this last three years will come very soon, and that Danielle will do that. We also hope that Pierre Polyev is going to be releasing that kind of information as well, do an inquiry find out what truly happened, uh, find out the truth, the, the medical data as well. And so I can't say much more than that because of the, um, the platform that we're on. So just how it is. Uh, my website is laurelin.tv. Thank you very much. We were able to kind of go live to the website today, JT. Something unique happened there. Um, so we're going to figure out how that's happening, right? It's not, it's not there now, is it? Or is it? It's a commercial. This is the way to save on oh, energy bills in 2023. <laughs> so I can hear it. Can you hear it? Does it? Oh, did you mute it? Okay. Um, so isn't that interesting? Now, why is a commercial on it? If it's our show that was, oh, see, I think there we go. So I don't know what's happening, but uh, it's, we just discovered by accident that we can go live to our website. And I don't know how you did it, but we have to do it every day now. So he was having a flip out a little bit earlier, not realizing that um, we've never done that and we should. So thank you very much for your support. If you are, uh, if you enjoy the kind of programming we do, the kind of truth that we bring, it means a lot to us if you'll help us to do it. Um, this keeps the lights on. This helps all of us to be kind of uh, get a little bit of lunch money as well as we do the shows for you because our goal is to bring you the truth and to follow the things that are happening in the world that nobody else is. Mainstream media across the world has a pact together, and that is to only do the talking points of those that pay their paychecks. They are instructed and told what to speak about. But here, we have only one person telling us what to talk about, and that's God. 
And God will sometimes tell us that we need to highlight a certain issue so that we can be helpful to others. And then um, when there's, uh, you know, breaking whistleblowers and things like that across the world, we like to tell you the truth about that as well. And so in so doing, we have expenses, we have equipment, uh, we shoot on a, a camera that we've actually had for many years now, but it's a really good quality camera. We have good quality lighting kind of in this studio because um, that helps to make the show very presentable. We've got some good audio stuff because we want to make sure that, um, that you're able to hear us and to see us and that you're enjoying the show. And look, we were able to watch the earlier uh, going on, right? It's, oh, is it? It's a, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it real or Memorex? So thank you very much. We make it easy. If you can help us, it means a lot. At the end of this year, um, perhaps you're looking for places to get an income tax receipt, and we offer that as well. So any donations are receivable, and this is because we are a Christian organization, and we tell the truth based on a biblical worldview, um, highlighting current events, issues, topics of interest, and we do it from God's perspective, which of course is always not telling lies. So if you go the, to the donate button that's on laurelin.tv and you push it, you'll be able to go in. And um, so many people, like yesterday, we got another anonymous uh, donor, very hard on me when you're anonymous, because I do um, try and send a thank you to every single person who sends us um, a kind a kind gift. And uh, so thank you to all of the anonymous donors, but I'm not able to thank you because it won't even let me know who you are or anything. So you still get an income tax receipt for donating anonymously, but for those of you who appreciate truth, righteousness, and the pursuit of of all that is honest and just at this hour. That's what we're doing. And you help us to do that. So if you're able to make a one-time donation, if you wanna do it on a monthly basis, that's really helpful as well. Because, you know, then it's just a, you could do a smaller or even larger amount, uh, but you do it over time. You get the income tax receipt right away when you do that through Canada Helps as you go into the donate button. Another way is by e-transfer. So Laura Lynn live at protonmail.com. That is the way. Are you able to put that up on the screen, JT? Laura Lynn live at protonmail.com. And uh, if you can send e-transfers through there, if that's an easy route for you, that works fantastic. And we say thank you to you. Um, we send you an income tax receipt at year end. And we are blessed, blessed beyond measure that you'll take the time to help us to do it. Um, you know, some, some people might say, well, what is, um, you know, how, how do I know you'll be here? Like, you know, Laurel, and maybe you're a fly by night and you'll be gone. Well, first of all, we haven't been gone for a, a lot of years. <laughs> it's been three, three, four years now coming up that we've made this all we can do. This is it. We feel called by God to do exactly what we're doing here. And we're not going anywhere. We're going to do it for a long time. And we've been able to save, I want you to know something, thousands and thousands of lives. And that's because we've told the truth and we've helped people to make good decisions. And they've been able to know the truth and the truth set them free. So kind of cryptic, I know. Um, thank you. We also have a P.O. Box, uh, Box 48184 in New Westminster, B.C. Thank you for supporting us, joining us. Thank you for helping us to do what we do. I love getting all your little letters. In fact, I went through a, a little group of them last night. I get special little notes and cards. It means the world to us. I want to leave you today with something very powerful for your life so that you are emboldened. Um, to speak the truth and to do what is right. So the word of God in James 4 verse 7 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Do you know what's an interesting thing? Um, this doesn't say, you know, kick the devil 
in, uh, in, in the teeth. It doesn't say smack them yourself. It doesn't say rebuke uh, the devil. It actually just says resist the devil and he will flee from you. I think it is actually that, that easy. Do you know that the devil cannot read your mind? So only God can read your mind. The enemy cannot read your thoughts. So let's say you're having a really bad moment and, and you feel really anxious and you're so upset about something. This is why you don't speak out loud curses into your life because the devil, he, he's trying to figure out what you're thinking. He's trying to figure out how to discourage you. So if he doesn't know it's working, he, he doesn't have a, a stronghold to keep using that tactic to keep inserting his fear based thoughts. You know, he doesn't have that ability to keep sort of, um, frustrating you in life. Do you ever have a day when you just know the devil's working to frustrate you? Well, never let him know that you are. He can't read your mind. So do not tell him out loud. Oh, I, oh, my life sucks. You know, I mean, say it if it's a joke. Cause I say that all the time because I think it's so hysterical when I say it and I just laugh out loud at myself. But if I don't want the enemy to know that I'm feeling angst or worry or concern, I don't say it out loud because he doesn't know what I'm thinking. If you say things out loud, you're giving intel to the enemy. And unfortunately we have a odorless, colorless, um, sightless. We, we can't see the devil, but he's all around us. You know, he's just trying to, I mean, thank God we can't thank God. Once in a while you can smell a stench and you think, I think that's demonic. But most of the time we, we just, we kind of lose, uh, you know, track of the, the fact that we're feeling aggravation and the enemy's trying to put worry or uh, concern or trying to bring temptations to us. And we forget it's actually the devil. So, so instead of letting him know, you know, and he's watching everything you do. So for me, it's really important that I just give God all honor out loud. I just thank him so many times a day out loud. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing for me. Thank you, God. I submit everything to you. God, I know that you're in full control of my life. Lord, I know that you're fully in charge of my family. Lord, I know that you are fully able to bring about um, victory in this situation that I'm facing. Lord, I know that you're fully in charge of my finances and you are the God who provides. The cattle on a thousand hills are yours and I trust you with with my substance, my sub, my substances. Sus, yeah. What'd you say? Sustenance. <laughs> I trust you with my sustenance. I let the devil know nonstop all day that I declare that God is in control, not you enemy. And whenever I feel, you know, um, something that I don't want the enemy to know, I don't say it out loud. Remember to protect yourself in that way. God bless. Have a great one. You know, it's not easy to deliver the truth of what our sick world is doing, but for some of us, we feel that we have no choice because if we are silent about these abominable things, then we are letting evil go unchecked and we cannot do that. For those of you wonderful people who are writing me and are sharing your encouragement, I am deeply grateful. Thank you for all the letters that you've been sending. Thank you for the donations and the support. I found out that in order to speak the truth, you have to become very, very strong. If you would go to my website at www.lauralyn.tv, you'll find all of the ways that you can contact me. Remember, my friends, all is well. All is well. Thanks for joining me.